As John Fuang used to say, there are three important parts to concentration practice. The first is learning how to do it. The second is how to maintain it. And the third is how to use it. In the doing, it's a simple matter of bringing the mind to the breath. Or if you're going to use butto or the parts of the body or any of the recollections, whatever your topic you've chosen. You try to bring the mind to the breath and then evaluate it. Is this a good place to stay? And you make adjustments. If the breath doesn't feel quite right, you can breathe in a different way. Or if you find that making the mind stay focused on a certain part of the body gives you a headache or gives a sense of discomfort, you can focus someplace else. There's no law that you have to stay at the nose or that the breath can be felt only at the nose. Because after all, the breath is the energy in the body. It's not just the air coming in and out. The air coming in and out, that's the effect of the breath. The actual breath is the movement of energy. You can feel it in the, in the lungs, in the rib cage, in your back, in your shoulders. So anywhere where you notice, now the breath is coming in, now the breath is going out, you can feel the energy. Stay focused there. And try to keep your focus just right, not so strong that it blocks things, and not so weak that it drifts off. So these are things that you evaluate and adjust. And this is an important part of the concentration. We're not just trying to blank out our minds. We're trying to use our powers of thought for a good purpose. We give the mind a place where it can settle down. And then once it's settled down, you don't want it to jump up and run to the refrigerator, or run off to the computer, or run outside. You want to train yourself to stay right here. That's the maintaining part. And here again, it requires some thought. Thoughts will come up, distractions will come up, and you have to learn how to see them just as that, as distractions, something you don't want to get involved with, something you don't want to have overcome the mind. And so part of this means keeping in mind the fact you don't want to go with them, and the second part means how do you find a greater sense of ease and well-being in the breath? So you feel attracted to staying here. Again, this requires using your powers of thought, observation, your sensitivity, to getting the mind into balance and then maintaining that balance. Now, some of the lessons you learn in the, the doing and the maintaining will come more to the forefront in the using. In other words, part of maintaining your concentration means seeing thoughts simply as events in the mind, without a lot of meaning. You may have a thought of your mother, a thought of your family, a thought of home. And instead of getting involved in all the meanings and narratives that go around those thoughts, you just simply say, okay, there's that thought. It's an event. It may have been triggered by who knows what. But learning to see it as an event is something that you have the choice to get involved with or not get involved with. That's a necessary skill in the maintaining. And then in the using, you start developing that skill even more. So you begin to realize this thought that came from who knows where, you're going to find out where, what triggered it, how the mind gets involved in these thoughts. What are the stages of a thought developing and then you're deciding to explore what is this little potential here? What could it be? What's a thought about? 
And to what extent does the thought actually have a predetermined con concept or predetermined meaning or a topic? And to what extent do you just go ahead and decide, well, the thing I want to really think about right now is X, and you go with it and you turn this thought into a thought about X. That's one of the things you want to see, because you want to see the arbitrariness of all this. We're attached to our thoughts because they have meaning, they have their uses. Giving meaning to these little impulses that go to the brain. That's an important part of functioning in the world. But we have to see how that functioning is not always good, not always skillful. And there are times we're better off when we can let it go, not get involved. And see, so you want to have the skill to learn how to turn these things off and really understand them. So when you really need them, you can turn them on, and when you don't need them, you can turn them off. As the Buddha said, when you master thoughts, you think the thoughts you really need and want to think, and you don't think the thoughts you don't want to. Most of us are subject to whatever comes up. As the Buddha says, we start thinking and then it turns into objectification. There's the I in there that's doing the thinking. And then there's the world in which this thinker lives, and how do these thoughts relate to either the I or the world in which this thinker wants to move around in. And once you get thoughts of that sort, they turn around and they attack you. They overwhelm you, as, as one translation is, they assail you. And so we end up being a victim of our thoughts. It's like the people who raise little tiger cubs at home. When the tiger cubs are little, they're cute. And they grow up and they turn into big tigers, and one day they get angry and they turn around and they eat you. So you have to be careful with your thinking. This is why it's good to have a place where you can step out of it for a while, so it doesn't automatically take over, doesn't automatically rule the mind. You want your alertness and mindfulness to be more in charge. This is the meaning of the word faculty, something in charge, indriya in Pali. It's related to the word inda, who's the king of the gods, the dominant god. And you want to turn mindfulness and alertness into dominant factors in the mind, so that they're in charge, rather than just whatever arbitrary thought or arbitrary desire comes popping up. And so the use of the concentration here is so that you can gain some control over your thoughts and your emotions. You can step back from them. There's a thought of boredom. There's a thought of distress. There's a thought of depression. You can step back from these thoughts, and you don't have to be ruled by them. And when you begin to see the role that your own passion plays in all this, we really have a passion for thinking. That's why we fabricate our thoughts. If without the passion, the thoughts wouldn't get fabricated. There'd be these little impulses, but they wouldn't go anywhere. But we pick them up and run with them. So we're complicit in what's happening. That's only when we see that we're complicit in our own suffering. That's when we can begin to step back from it, let it go, develop that disenchantment and dispassion that the Buddha is talking about. So when disturbing thoughts come up, you move in. You've got your raw material for the concentration, for the development of concentration, the uses of concentration. In the beginning, it's just a matter of learning how to fend them off, give them quick karate chops so they don't come in, and take up a lot of time in your meditation. So you do have the time to develop a foundation. And then if the foundation starts to crumble, it's usually because you've gotten complacent. It's going well, things are fine, you sit back, relax, and it all just falls apart. So the maintaining is an important skill. And in the course of the maintaining, you're going to gain at least a certain amount of insight into these processes that 
normally take over the mind, but don't have to. As you learn how to see them simply as events that arise that you don't have to identify with, you don't have to follow. Then as your powers of concentration get better, this line of thought is going to become more and more useful and go deeper and deeper into understanding the wellsprings of these thoughts, where they come from, why you go for them, until they lose their appeal. Once they've lost their appeal, then you're in charge. It's not the Buddha's trying to make you dead. It's simply that you're not carried away with the tools you've got. You realize that you've got tiger cubs and you've got to be careful around them. And when you learn how to declaw them and defang them, then you're safe.